Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Logan Larson, Mike Akins, and Norm Fazekas. Coming up on DTNS, well, there's LastPass. We will talk about that. But the rest of the time, it's going to be your questions and answers on the last newly recorded show of the year. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, December 23rd, Christmas Eve Eve 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. In the 314, I'm Patrick Norton. Drawing the top tech stories from Hoth, I'm Len Peralta. And from a little north of the frozen north, I'm Anthony Lemos. And and I'm the show's producer, <laughs> Roger Chang. Roger's the only one who gets to say and. Everybody's throwing in ands. <laughs> Roger is the last one. He gets the and. Stop taking Roger. No, uh, Sarah Lane has the day off, but the rest of us are here. It's going to be a Q&A episode. Thanks to everybody who sent us Q&As. Uh, we will get to as many of them in the show as possible. If you are a patron, we'll get to more of them in Good Day Internet. Uh, and then if we don't get to all of them, I'll try to answer them directly over emails. First, the bad news, or what we usually call the quick hits. In August of this year, LastPass announced that an unauthorized party had gained access to portions of the LastPass development environment through a single compromised developer account and took portions of some source code along with some proprietary LastPass technical information. At the time, LastPass said its systems had prevented the actor from accessing customer data or encrypted password vaults. That breach seems like it was part of a larger swath of breaches related to Twilio, which affected hundreds of companies. However, on November 30th, LastPass announced that using some of the information that was accessed in August, a second breach had happened in which an unauthorized party gained access to some LastPass customer information stored on a third-party cloud service. Now, LastPass didn't say, but reading the tea leaves, sounds like it was something on AWS. LastPass said it was still investigating at the time what was actually accessed from that container. And Thursday... LastPass told us the results of that investigation. It said that an intruder used cloud storage keys stolen from a LastPass employee to access a backup of customer vault data. The vault was stored in a proprietary binary format and contained, quote, both unencrypted data, such as website URLs, as well as fully encrypted sensitive fields, such as website usernames and passwords, secure notes, and form-filled data. LastPass emphasized that the encryption was strong enough that given current technology, they could only be unencrypted with the user's password. Whether the threat actors can access a vault would depend on how strong that password was against brute force attacks, uh, in other words, just random guessing, and whether the account was also protected by a second factor. If you had 2FA on, it would be even harder to try to guess everything. Uh, the attackers also accessed names, email addresses, phone numbers, and some billing information. But hey, not credit card numbers, just your encrypted passwords. LastPass detailed several measures it has taken in response, including rebuilding the compromised development environment from scratch, engaging a managed endpoint detection and response service, and rotating all potentially affected credentials and certificates on the inside. So those are the things they're taking to stop this from happening again. TechCrunch's Zach Whitaker, who has earned my retrust uh, in reporting on security for many years, recommends that at a minimum... LastPass users should change their current LastPass password to something new and unique. That will immediately change the encryption of all your vaults. Anyone concerned that that password might not be strong enough to protect the old vault, so especially if you used a short password or were reusing a password that you used on other things, you should change all the passwords stored in your vault, starting with the most critical. And finally, users who have had their account since 2018 or before should check to make sure their passwords are being hashed with the strongest password-based key derivative function that LastPass offers, which is 100,100 password iterations. Uh, you don't have to know what any of that means, but do go into your account settings by choosing Show Advanced Settings. That's different than a separate section called Advanced Options. Don't get confused. Go to Account Settings, click the button that says Show Advanced Settings, look for the password-based key derivation function, and hopefully it says 100,100. If it doesn't, you'll probably want to change it to that. 
Uh, Patrick, suffice to say, when these stories happen, I tend to try to say, hey, vulnerabilities happen. It's good that they catch them. This isn't as bad as it looks. This one is pretty bad. Yeah, I, you know, I was, I, I literally, I don't know if anybody heard some tapping, but I was, I typed out my passphrase that I use for LastPass and I was counting it and it's, I think, 27 digits of stuff. Um, I won't tell you what it is in case anybody's out there. Fab, you know, it's, <sighs> let's roll this back a little bit. Uh, I, I will admit I've been a little bit, I'm, I'm a long time LastPass user. I've been a little frustrated lately because they're like, hey, store your credit cards. Hey, you just typed in an address. Want us to store that? And hey, I'm really annoyed by that, uh, in part because they haven't figured out how to turn off or even if there's an ability to turn off that. So I'm a little agitated with LastPass to begin with. Uh, and I, again, having you know worked in small quarters with hackers, I, 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 I am willing to be like, okay, bad thing happened, but... Uh, that said, you know, as a customer, as a longtime user, the whole we're going to drop this at uh, 535 Eastern Standard Time, this announcement at 535 Eastern Standard Time, the day before, uh, you know, Thursday before Christmas, um, you know, that that there's a reason you do that. And it's, you know, and I get it right. They're a company. They're trying to make a profit. They're part of a bigger company. Um, they're, they're there to make money and they're there to minimize the damage on this. And they don't want people to overreact, but boy, you really piss me off as a customer when you do things like that. Um, you know, and the way they announced it, you know, there's this very unassuming, you know, uh, subject on the email and they did everything they could. And then you start reading, you're like, Oh, you've got the entire hairball that contains all of my passwords. It's encrypted. It's encrypted with my case with a very, very long password. Um, but the combination of it took you how many months to figure this out? You waited, you finally, you know, a couple of days before Christmas when, you know, half of the people who work in media have gone home for the year or anybody or for that matter, any major corporation uses this because because LastPass is used by a lot of large corporations. Um I I am feeling a violation of trust at a level that I'm I'm not used to feeling on something like this. Uh, and, and this is bad. Now, even if the encryption holds, assuming everything's solid, this is still somebody will have for whatever subset of the user base that they're able to grab the information for, they will have your entire collection of passwords, which to, you know, the part of me that, you know, just on the near side of a tinfoil hat wearing kind of guy, because of spending a lot of time in small rooms with hackers is like, okay, I need to switch my password manager because I'm angry and I want to make a statement. Uh, I need to switch it to something that's at least as secure. There's options out there. I won't get into that. That's a whole subject for another day. Uh, and then I need to change every password that's managed inside of this so that I don't have a, you know, that, that, in the incredibly, intensely, totally unlikely possibility that they crack the hash and get into all of my stuff, um, which you know I'm you know which either means there's a flaw in their encryption or somebody's made some sort of quantum leap. Uh, I need to change all of my passwords for security purposes, which is a whole lot of work I don't feel like doing. And hey. Maybe I should think it's thoughtful of them to give me this opportunity to update every password I have over the holiday break. But mostly I'm just kind of staggered by how long it took. And we could say they were being, you know, calm and careful. But I got a real feeling like they knew about this at November 30th. and They just sat on it or not long after that, which is not we, fair. We don't know that. Uh, yeah, and, we don't. So I'm, I'm going to cut. I'm going to cut you short uh, because I, I think both of us I'm are not. fairly emotional ab about this. Uh, and and there are some, some some people in our chat room. They're like, "Hey, wait a minute. What what if they didn't know it? They you wouldn't want them to wait till January third because it's Christmas and and release it later. You want them to release it at the earliest opportunity. So true. Let let's pull our own anger because I'm right there with you back and say, all right, let's say that November 30th is when they found out something happened and they immediately told us and to and Thursday was the earliest that they were sure and they didn't want to say it before they were sure Let, let's give them the benefit of that doubt uh you're right that email was vague that email should have said this is very serious and it has your passwords because I got that email glanced at it and like oh it's probably just emails uh and addresses I'll look at it later uh so that I felt was a, a bit of a problem. But the biggest problem here is the one line I've always had with any password manager, whether it's LastPass, OnePass, whatever, is 
yes, you're going to get attacked, but the one thing you have to make sure never gets accessed is the password vaults. And yes, they have done lots of things to make sure that those are as secure as possible. But there's a line in the sand for me that says, once you've not properly protected the vaults, the, as much as you've protected the credit card information, right. you have lost trust, period. Uh, I think LastPass, r rationally pulling my own feelings back, is mostly doing a good job with this. If if you give them the benefit of the doubt, they they are telling you everything. The communication they have could it be improved? Could the email have been better? Yes, but it's all there. They're not hiding anything. Uh, so really, when you rationally look at it, it's like okay, they they may have done everything they could. The fact remains that their system, while highly targeted. Uh, gave up the one thing that they are not allowed to give up, in my opinion. Uh, and so I will be uh, moving. Uh, I, I, don't, I won't be moving this minute, but I will be moving off of LastPass because they have betrayed the one thing that I held them to. Like, you know what? Everybody might give up email addresses, things like that. But as long as you protect that vault uh, and nobody accesses that, because... Having the vault highly encrypted now is not the same as having the vault highly encrypted two years later when they will crack this and they will get into all of that information. That right. information won't be as valuable a few years later, uh, but it's still something that I wouldn't have put in a place I thought people could access. Yeah, it's, you know, it's intensely frustrating. Uh, you know, I guess... And, and and to everybody's credit, I agree with everybody writing in the chat room. You are absolutely correct. There is a strong possibility they they did not know until, let's say, let's give, really give them the benefit of the doubt, 3 o'clock on the 22nd, and it took them an hour to get sign off on all the various executives that had to sign on it, you know, through uh last it's still path annoying. Me in. yeah <laughs> it's you know i and, and i will admit, i like, guess my point is it's mostly annoying because it happened at all right like even, absolutely even once you get past that like you shouldn't absolutely. even be having to think about it you this is what you paid them this for. should not have happened yeah this is exactly. the whole point of me trusting them is that this was not supposed to happen yeah. and again yeah, it's, understandable. <laughs> it's understandable that it happened and understandable that they're a target and therefore it's understandable that i'll be taking my business elsewhere yeah, and it's it's uh, you know, and there's something worth discussing at this point, and and I'm sure it's covered fairly regularly. But you know, I recently had a coworker, you know, click on something, and you know, this you know, when I'm talking to people who are doing penetration testing and stuff like that, when they're when they're verifying the security almost invariably they get access or, you know, they, they get privileges, they can actually, they get access and they do it usually through some type of phishing operation. Now, you know, there's phishing, there's smishing, there's a bunch of other stuff out there, but fundamentally you have to be really careful um, who has access to what, and you have to be incredibly careful about what you click on or what you access because there are, there are constant attempts to gain access to your information. And when I say constant, it's everything from yeah. stupid. And LastPass knows this. It's yeah. not like they don't know it. It's not like they haven't been taking measures to stop it, but they didn't. Right. That's yeah, the and fact all that, it takes is, you know, it's not they should have known, it's they didn't. They didn't yeah, succeed. And, and all it takes is Scoreboard. one person, you <laughs> yeah. know, you know, one person not paying attention, one person having a lapse of judgment, uh, and, and everything falls apart. Um, all right. I think we've spent most of our Christmas episode <laughs> talking about LastPass, unfortunately. Uh, do, you, do you have another story we could move on to before we get to the Q&As? By Dan's confirmed Thursday that its employees had accessed IP addresses and some other user data for several U.S. journalists in order to see if it matched known locations of other ByteDance employees. They wanted to discover who was leaking information about ByteDance's ties to the government of China. ByteDance determined that its chief internal auditor, Chris Lepetak, was responsible for the team engaging in the tracking. ByteDance has fired Lepetak. Forbes reports that ByteDance has also fired four other employees involved in the scheme. ByteDance spokesperson Hillary McQuaid said, quote, Quote, the misconduct of certain individuals who are no longer employed at ByteDance was an egregious misuse of their authority to obtain access to user data, end quote. Okay. Good to bring well, a cheerful I mean, thought into the show on Christmas. <laughs> I guess it's good that they fired some people. How about this yes. for a palate cleanser? The Financial Times sources say TSMC is in advanced talks with suppliers on setting up a plant in Dresden, Germany. 
Dresden is the capital of Saxony, uh, a state in the eastern part of Germany. A team of TSMC's senior executives are expected to discuss plans with the German government early next year. Yay! Or chips. We like that. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about your questions. David writes, in episode 4406, you talked about streaming TV. What do you all use to track what is coming? What have you seen? Et cetera. You can do that. Yeah. So I use Apple TV <laughs> to a certain extent, right? So sure. I have the I have changed a setting in Apple TV so that the top ribbon is always showing me the most recent episode. That way, when a new episode of a show I watch comes in, it shows up there. It shows up for almost everything except for Netflix. Uh, everything else shows up there. So that's part of what I do. The other part I do is a, an app that is tied into Tracked TV. The app I use is called TVST. There's a ton of apps that tie into Tracked TV, but T R A K T dot TV lets you log in and uh, and track your watching, and it will let you know when new episodes uh, come out as well. So some of the stuff that Apple TV doesn't catch, uh, I will track on Track TV, and I'll also go in there and mark stuff as watched once I I watch it. Sounds like David does something similar. Do you do anything like that? I uh, you know I'm 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 never this sophisticated with my. I, I usually I'm at this stage of my life where there's certain shows that are not particularly child friendly and I watch them after the children go to sleep, which is much later than it used to be. So my biggest challenge now is not, for example, falling asleep while something is playing in Netflix and then waking up and found that it's played through the entire season and then moved on <laughs> to whatever else decided to, to stream next. I would also like to point out that Tracked is T-R-A-K dot TV. Uh, assuming that is the same app. I, I'm actually kind of tempted by this. I also will say that a huge part of the way I watch television is just randomly discovering it's, stuff. Yeah, it's T-R-A-K-T dot TV. So. All right, I'm Patrick, past- Norm has a TV mounted over a fireplace and wants to get a center speaker. Send along a pick. Thank you for that, Norm. Uh, Norm says, I have about four spare inches to play with and already have a receiver back there. Do you have any good options that would fit in that space? Could I potentially mount something? So if you're not watching the video, this is uh, an inset above a fireplace. The television is kind of pushed back a few inches from the front edge. It acts kind of like a, a box shape for a mantle. Um, can you potentially mount something? Absolutely. You could hang a speaker in front of that if you don't mind it sort of getting in front of that trim edge below there. Uh, this is a place where a sound bar would work really well. Uh, the challenge in many cases is finding a small speaker that will fit in that space that is worth having there that also doesn't block your screen. Um, you know, there's a, some of the smaller speakers that actually sound really good. Uh, one of Wirecutter's picks is the Polk Signature Elite ES30 center channel speaker, um, which is fairly small for a home theater speaker, but is still big enough to carry a couple of 5.25, five and a quarter inch woofers. And uh, that's going to block a lot of your screen. You're going to have to experiment. Um, there are some fairly thin sound bars that might be worth going for there. Uh, or there are some sound bar sort of shaped speakers. You might experiment with that. I would also say anytime you're putting a speaker up on a mantle or a shelf, you want to make sure that speaker is pulled as far forward as possible because when the high frequencies come out of the tweeter, what you don't want is for them to immediately bounce against the, the mantelpiece or the shelf and then create a very early first order reflection because that's going to make your sound really funky. Uh, in a bunch of ways that are uh, not euphonic or unpleasant to listen to. Um, but you're going to have to search around for a speaker that works with your remaining speakers or a sound bar that works with your remaining speakers because that's about all you're going to fit up there unless uh, you have familial permission to put a large center speaker above that television. Some families will go for that. Some families will say nay for aesthetic reasons. And I cannot answer that for you, sir. All right. Norm also uh, wanted had a question for Len. Uh, can you randomly draw a fish in today's art? Maybe one that looks like <laughs> Napoleon. You know, um, I think that is possible. As a matter of fact, if you look at the screen right now, I've I've sort of gotten a, a head start on that. So yes, audio audio uh, listeners, Len is leaving you out. I will berate him about that later. Don't worry. <laughs> Sorry about that. But uh, that more reason to watch the video portion. But yes, Norm. Uh, maybe you're just a big fan of uh, the French Revolution and and uh, and, uh, and and that. So uh, for sure, I I can draw a fish that looks like Napoleon, and I'm assuming that it's the the leader 
um, and not Napoleon Dynamite. So. Uh, yeah, that's true. Norm did not <laughs> specify. So this is what you get, Norm. There you go. Uh, folks, if you have a thought about something on the show, but you don't know our email address, uh, we will get to emails after the first of the year, but send them to us. Uh, it, uh, get in right now. Our email is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Craig has a question. How important would tech or tech news be in your personal lives if it wasn't part of your day job? Uh, Craig also asked, imagine you all work together in the same capacity as you do today, but in a world where you had zero interest in covering tech news, what do you think you'd be podcasting about? So a two-part question here. Oh, boy. Uh, I think the irony is that for many things I do, that 20 years ago tech weren't involved in them at all certain aspects of tech are all over them but the primary source of information is tech um so you know the home theater system the audio system i deal with um certain aspects of working on cars uh 3d printing all these other things all of them sort of wrap in and around technology uh at a level that i think i couldn't have imagined 25 years ago um, so I, I think it would still be important in my day job because so much of my life depends on things I have to do on a computer working well. And that's how I got into this was computers not doing what they were. <laughs> it's easy. You just run this application and then the application would crash or there'd be a conflict or something else would happen. That's literally how I ended up, you know, doing this for a living. So I feel like I would not have, you know, I, literally I can draw a direct line from a tractor to a poetry magazine, you know, to the screensavers. <laughs> and the magazines before that. So Yeah, no, I have a similar answer. I, tech was part of my life going back to my dad playing with cassettes, uh, you know, even before we had computers and, and me playing with his calculator uh, that he would use uh, for work and, and trying to, you know, enjoy, figure out how it worked and all that sort of thing. And then of course, later on the TI-99 4A and the Commodore 64. So if it hadn't become part of my day job somehow, it would have been surprising. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I think it would still be very important. What would I be doing if I had zero interest in covering tech news? Uh, I would be podcasting about TV, probably TV and entertainment. I, I, I look right to Cord Killers or, or Sword and Laser and be like, yep, those are the things that I am also interested in that I'm also podcasting about. So I think... That's probably it. Like some kind of sci-fi genre related something or other. Maybe sports. Maybe sports. I was a sports like director the, once. Sorry, it was somehow turned sports director into athletic director in my head and I had you in coaches' shorts and started giggling yeah. at Sarah Never wore coaches' shorts. No. You know, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that statement at all. Um and it's funny, right? Because one of the one of the shows I did at uh, Revision Three that Roger actually uh was involved in putting together was Die Trying. And I think the second episode of that Michael Hand and I did, we made donuts. So, you know, that that was there was a lot of DIY stuff we did in that show that was specifically avoiding like computer builds or Raspberry Pi hacks or other stuff like that, simply because we wanted to have a a to look at a broader or to you know be more inclusive of more DIY stuff in there that wasn't necessarily and now we were going to adjust the code for the flamometer. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. mocking himself, but, but yeah, you know, you know, music. There's a time I wrote a lot about music. There's times. Uh, I can see you totally doing music like a music podcast. Even now, I could see you doing one, much less if there was a world where you didn't do tech. So, yeah. I feel so far behind the musical scenes these days. <laughs> no, that just makes you niche. That's all that does. Yeah. Uh, Will has a question. Uh, what tech item were you the most disappointed by? What tech item were you the most surprised by? I think the one that I was most surprised by was probably the TI-994A. I'll be honest. I was surprised at what I liked about it. Uh, I liked programming. I liked doing basic. I thought I was just going to use it for games because I wanted an Atari 2600. And my dad, uh, I've told the story a million times, but my dad was like, 
you can either take the money you saved up and buy the Atari, or I will give you extra money to buy the TI, which is twice as much. And I got the TI because I couldn't resist. And then I ended up learning basic instead of doing what I thought I would do, which was just play games. And I thought I would be disappointed that the games weren't as cool. Uh, and I ended up programming my own games. So that's the one I was probably most surprised by. The one I was most disappointed by was the original iPhone. I loved the browser, but then I, I quickly realized that I'm like, this thing doesn't really do anything else. And then they added the app store. Once they added the app store, suddenly, you know, all bets were off. Uh, but was, I was really di disappointed by that first iPhone after the first week or so. Oh, man. It's funny, right? Because the iPhone, the iPod was really, uh, the iPod was really mind blowing for me because I had, I had literally worked with the first two there, there was like there was a, a digital computer came up with what was the first mp3 player and then a korean company came up with sort of the first solid state mp3 player and then everybody started to do mp3 players and then the ipod came out and it was one of those surreal moments where you know it did so many things so much better than everything else out there. It was really kind of mind blowing, especially the interface. Like I remember people are like, well, creative has a superior, you know, whatever. And I remember laughing and I was like, okay, I have 300 songs on this, on this, uh, and do me a favor, scroll to this song in the creative. And then they would scroll to it on the iPod and they'd be like, Oh, so that's how an interface is supposed to work when you're dealing with large amounts of information. Um, <laughs> You know, it could just because it, there was a usability factor on it that just blew everything else out of the water. And they had really, really good sound quality. Um, I was still kind of blown away by that. Um, in terms of disappointed, uh, I will I will say something fairly broad. Pretty much every single VR or 3D experience I had up until the, you know, second Oculus Rift. Um, because it was one of those yeah. things where there, there were these terrible 3d glasses. And my theory was about every three to five years, somebody found another container of these that, that were like, you know, returned to the factory in Shenzhen or lost somewhere. And they would, you know, they would put together, you know, the, the 3d gaming environment of the future, you know, or they would increase the resolution a tiny bit from like 640 by 480. It looks like a 17 foot television to 800 by 600 or something ridiculous. And they would be just as atrocious as the last time you you put them on and just as unusable and just as annoying and have just as few software apps. And then when the Oculus Rift got past that initial, you know, most people who put it on or many people who put it on want to vomit to the phase where it was like few, much fewer people wanted to vomit and there were games and people to play with. I was like, wow. This is really cool. Uh, yeah. No, I, uh, I, I, it's hard for me to think of tech that I was disappointed by, uh, because like Nick with a C, uh, it, you, if you expect it all to disappoint you, you, you just end up being surprised <laughs> that, it, that it works. I, I, uh, I have one clear example, and that is the EOS R, the Canon EOS R. It was the first mirrorless full-size Canon camera. And uh, it did not perform to the specs. Well, I mean, it, it did what it said on the box. Oh, this was your do... disappointment. Not most yeah, this is my standards. disappointment. Because <laughs> um, I, I got it because I wanted to go full frame. And what ended up happening is I stayed with my APS-C sensor because I could shoot sports with it. And shooting sports with the EOS R was a pain. Then I got the R5, and it was everything that the EOS R had promised to be in my head. Um, my biggest uh, surprise is the, the um, Mac Mini M1. Holy oh, hell, because Lord. of the, how how yeah. amazing that processor yeah, it, it's is! It's just yeah, such a that. jump. I, I expected it to be incremental because I was getting one anyway because of my my old Mac Mini was so old. But it, I I my gaming computer is no longer my production computer. It is now just right. for gaming because I can do all my production on the M1. It's amazing. So quick and simple. All right, our last question: What's the calendar look like for the rest of the year? For example, are you having a predictions show? Uh, yes, Chris, we are in fact having a predictions show. Uh, the calendar for the rest of the year uh, is that there will be no show on Monday. Uh, that is Christmas Day observed holiday. Then. Tuesday the 27th is our listener co-host show. We invited some of our longest running patrons 
to be part of the show uh, this year. Uh, and uh, we've got uh, some really, really fun conversations coming your way. Uh, Wednesday, the 28th, is the Reminiscence Show. It's Sarah, Roger, and I just remembering our time at Tech TV, when we first met each other at Tech TV, what we were doing there, <laughs> other things about our time. Yes, Patrick Norton may get mentioned once or twice in the course of those stories. Uh, apologies, Patrick. Thursday, the 29th, is the Predictions Results Show. So that's where we go back to everybody who was on the prediction show last year. So Nika, Stephanie, Sarah, uh, myself, and Shannon. And we look over all of our predictions and say, okay, how would we do? Uh, we're all very generous with each other. I felt like everyone was like, I don't think I got that right. And then everyone else would be like, oh, I give you half credit. You got this part right. So uh, it's, a, it's a fun way to kind of look at what we were thinking last year compared to this year. And Friday the 30th will be our predictions for 2023. Uh, so that is uh, all of the things that we think are going to happen in 2023, all the things that are yet to come. Uh, we'll get them all right this time, I promise. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, we have our best of show, our, our best of uh, 2022. Uh, that will be coming on Monday, January 2nd. So there you go. Uh, January 2nd should be a no show, uh, but we, we didn't <laughs> we didn't have enough spaces. So, uh, so there, uh, we've got best of GDI kicking off. Actually, best of GDI and DTNS. Uh, Joe, Joe is pulling from all of GDI. So there's DTNS stuff in there as well. But it's kind of the best moments of the year uh, that was edited together by Joe. Uh, that's coming out Monday, January 2nd. Uh, that is the answer to that, Chris. All right. The moment you've all been waiting for. Did Len Peralta finish the fish that he was adding <laughs> to the art? Len? Uh, yes, I did. Actually, there is the fish. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome not the fish. Uh -oh. there's Wait. there is uh, the fish yeah. could be in or not it's kind of can be in yeah. or not so uh stick around for gdi because if you are in the chat room at twitch let me know what do you want because this will go up on fish my online no store and at my patreon patreon.com forward slash len or at my store len can store you at least com. commit to sending a fish version digitally to norm I can. Okay. Yes, right. absolutely. Oh, it looks like everybody. <laughs> We've got everybody a lot of early fish, fish support, but the yes, but the polls haven't closed yet. So. <laughs> it looks early. Early results say yes, fish. So. Uh, but otherwise, it's a holiday version of the DTS 19th, ninth year anniversary logo, which is an awesome logo. Thank you for that. Yes, it is very kind of Charlie Brownish too. So, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to everybody. Happy Holidays, Len. Thank you, uh, Tom. Yes, Amos. I can't help but notice that you missed something on that little calendar for the rest of the year. Oh, I'm sorry. What did I miss? I'm so, I'm so sorry. I was just going off what was in the calendar. What did I miss? Yeah. There's a thing on New Year's Eve called the Diamond Club New Year's Eve 27-hour streamathon. Oh, this isn't in DTNS, but this is going on, and you should know about it. Absolutely. And if people want to find you during the, during the break uh, on a little bit of a live stream, they can because they'll be right here on this channel and on uh, this the, channel. Uh, for those of you listening on audio, I will now be right. Amos along with Len later is <laughs> twitch.tv slash good day internet. Yes. <laughs> um, and then you can find the full, uh, the full schedule of everyone at DC Um It's going to be a blast. We raised over $10,000 last year and we've got a lot of the same people. We're hoping to raise even more money this year for children's miracle uh, network hospitals through extra life so helping helping uh, sick kids have a better uh time at the hospital with their families and stuff like that fantastic all right uh i will be there uh sarah may be there uh too so for sure you should be there uh what's the address again to go to dcstreamathon.org excellent patrick norton thank you as well for closing out the year with us what do you got going on to tell folks about Oh, my goodness. Uh, kind of rebooting some stuff on AVXL. We'll have our uh, next episode probably coming out at the beginning of the year. Robert Heron should be at CES checking out all the new televisions. So do us a favor. Search for AVEXCEL on your favorite podcatcher, and we look forward to you listening. Fantastic. Thanks to our brand new boss, and I think it might be someone who's in the chat room right now, Oz, the great and powerful Oz, spelled A-A-H-Z, who just started backing us on Patreon. Uh, Oz gets to be the last shout out of a new patron of the year. You 
could be among the first shout outs of 2023 folks get in there and support us patreon.com slash dtns oh, i see it's ozymandias not the great and powerful oz uh thank you ozymandias uh for supporting us on patreon the clock's ticking on that patreon merch patreon.com slash dtns my friends that is going to do it for dtns for 2022 uh, patrons aren't done yet. Stick around for that extended show, Good Day Internet. You can also catch the show when we return on January 3rd, live, Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. That will be our CES coverage when we return live uh, on January 3rd. You can find more about that, dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Again, no show on Monday, but we're back Tuesday with our special holiday week lineup, starting with our listener co-host episode with Anthony Marcos, James Thatcher, and Tim Jar. Happy holidays, everybody. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott S1, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Gutter. Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Contributors for this week's show included Ayaz Akhtar, Terrence Gaines, Scott Johnson, Rob Dunwood, and Patrick Norton. Yes, Chris, in answer to your question, I read these live. And thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>